I'm very happy to welcome our special guest for today, which is Kanika Agarwal. Hi. Hey, Kanika. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Good. Welcome and thank you for joining us on this special uh, chat today. Of course. Pleasure to be here. Great. Kanika, I just allow me a brief intro for the audience who have joined us today. Sure. Kanika is the founder and CEO of MindPeers, a mental well-being platform. She's also a serial entrepreneur and has scaled her first business to multi-million in Singapore by the age of 26. Recently, recognized for getting on LinkedIn's top 20 companies and also getting four shark deals with double investment in Shark Tank, in shark tank India. She currently flip-flops and uh, hustles between a home in Himachal and Singapore. Kanika, pleasure to have have you join us today i think we've set the tone and as you know we've uh, launched thrive at jm financial we've had we've been lucky to sort of coordinate with you on a couple of initiatives but to october uh, you know as everybody is talking about mental health awareness and uh, other things we want to understand from you and use the platform today to touch upon the theme which is prioritizing mental health in the workspaces Tell yeah. me what is your view on how important it is to have these conversations around whether from an employer perspective or from an employee perspective. I'd like to hear a brief, uh, you know, uh, chat about your views on this. Got it. So see the way I explain this and I have understood this is that I don't know how many of our viewers know that we have something called the theory of motivation. And this is Maslow's theory of motivation that I'm talking about. And what that theory basically says is it's a pyramid. And it says that when a human being has, so, so the first level, okay, over there is of physiological needs. So physiological needs is food, water, roof uh, over your head. And then as you go up the pyramid, the needs change. Okay, so from physiological, we go to safety, then we go to social belongingness. And then the final one is what you call self actualization. Okay, and self actualization means that I want my full potential and capabilities to be used. I want to be psychologically respected. I want to be heard. And only then I will feel motivated. Correct. Now, we are in an era where majority of your workforce is gradually becoming millennials and Gen Z. And these millennials and Gen Z especially, they don't have to worry about the physiological needs because the previous generations have somewhere taken care of that, right? So which means that the needs of the millennials and the Gen Zs is more on the psychological aspect. They are saying that if you hear me, if you want to trust me, let's say if I'm asking for a hybrid work setup, I still want you to trust me that, you know, my work is being done. If I'm saying that today I am not feeling the best, I want you to make me feel seen about it. I want you to, um, you know, sort of give me the platform to be at least transparent about it. Right. So I feel that firstly, this is where the need of changing the workplace culture is coming from. And that's why the entire conversations about mental well-being is becoming important at the workplace. And uh, this is where, you know, uh, such open, vulnerable and transparent, psychologically safe conversations are needed. Thanks, Kanika. You took me back to the psychology days back in college where we had the Maslow's theory. But I understand how critical it is to kind of, you know, once the physiological, uh, you know, uh, facts are taken care of, how important it is to talk about the culture. Hmm. Uh, given that backdrop, I just want to understand how, what is the importance of listening, you know, in this whole aspect when it comes to mental health? I mean, we all talk about listening, just being there for somebody, very matter of fact, very casually. But how important do you think does listening play a role when it comes to workspaces, yeah. offices, yeah. Yeah, especially in an office setup? 
How can yeah. we be there actively engaged in listening to our employees? What is it that we can do? I'd love to hear your thoughts yeah, on that. So, so such a lovely question. And I think uh, seldom we focus on this very basic thing of listening, right? Like, and we don't know that if you're actually patiently making yourself available to listen to someone, right? Whether it is in your personal setup or professional setup, it can actually do wonders. Now, one of why it is important, right? It's important because I think we are, again, in a time when everyone wants to prove that, hey, you know, I know this better than you probably, right? And all, all of us in this hustle are always like, you, you know, like, let's say if someone is talking to me and I'm listening, but I'm always just ready to reply back. I'm like, okay, okay, cool. you know, I listened, but did I just, did I deeply listen to what the person was saying? Because probably I'm just so much thinking about that. What am I supposed to answer back or what am I supposed to respond back with? So I feel that generally from a human being perspective, perspective we guys have always been more geared towards seeing talking instead of listening to someone and you know um i don't know if all of you who's watching us if you all have seen these very funny memes nowadays on instagram we see these reels where let's say there are partners uh, in relationships and uh, you know there is always this thing where one partner is complaining that you know this is what happened to me and the other partner starts giving solutions. Whereas the expectation was that I don't need a solution from you. I just want you to listen to me. Now, when I take that to the workplace, right? When we take that to the workplace, what we are saying is that would you be available to make me feel heard and to make me feel seen without any judgments can I share what exactly is going through with me, right? And, and it is such an important aspect that I especially feel leaders need to develop. Because, you know, when you are taking care, when you're managing so many members of your team, I know it gets difficult on leaders as well. And I think this is where I'm, I'm very happy to share an example with you all. I look up to this company called HubSpot. Okay, it's a CRM company, a global US company. And I remember a very long time back, um, I was talking to their, you know, to the to the teams in Singapore. And they told me that, and I don't know if they still follow this practice or not. Uh, but what they did was that every Friday, they created a culture of uh, reflective hours. And in these reflective hours, every leader, would sit for one hour with, you know, with all their team members. And the idea was that they would, first the leader will share what they went through in the week, you know, whatever they fought with, whatever they struggled with. So the power of the leader to be vulnerable. And now as the team members listened to it, it opened a space for the team members as well to share it back. And that's when the leader would listen to it and, you know, they created this beautiful circle of listening, of being vulnerable and of creating a safe space. So all in all, I think I just want to say that, uh, you know, we, we say we have one mouth, we have two ears, right? Re yet we end up talking more than listening. But uh, the world can be a really better place if we are there for our colleagues and, you know, just for people around us to listen to them without any judgments and with our full presence. Thanks, Kanitha. I think that was wonderful. I think you summed it up beautifully. I think my takeaway are two things. One is, of course, the example that you talked about. I think it'll be very nice for us also to, at some point, look at such initiatives where we open up and, you know, talk about our vulnerabilities so that, you know, people uh, are not perceived, for example, leaders, you know, especially they need to be, we need to humanize a lot of key softer aspects and make them seem like one of us, especially when it comes to larger teams. Uh, I think if I may just add to that, uh, you know, beyond what you have said is, you know, I think active listening goes a long way in establishing and building trust mm -hmm. and fostering a sense of empathy. I mean, probably sometimes we don't really, um, uh, you know, end up it being action focused, we may not have immediate solutions. But a lot of times, I think when we just listen and listen attentively, 
i think it helps break ice it helps you know ease up the conversation and people think that you genuinely care so from a short immediate impact term also i think Absolutely. it really helps to have these kind of conversations uh, so kanika just moving on if you may just tell me are there any telltale signs you know typically seen in a workplace where you know maybe i mean of course you know uh, individually we'll all know just before a high profile meeting we'll probably experience some sort of butterflies in the stomach palpitations but tell me anxiety or talking about stress are there any signs that we need to keep um, an eye for so that we can just nip it in the bud or probably take timely um, intervention from counselors uh, just throw some light on that yeah so i think before i do that i i want to say that i don't know for some reason majority of us and you know even i did that i was uh, i sort of you know we we teach people about this but i probably did not practice it myself but i don't know why as a society we wait we wait for the worst to happen so that especially mental well being can become a treatment and why are we not preventive with it so uh, to answer the signs and you know symptoms that one can look out for just before that i would love to say that it will be great if people are more preventive towards it it's like saying that you know even if your body is fit you still go to the gym to maintain it or you still go for your sports and you know whatever to maintain it so even if you think that mentally everything is going great you can still every day take out time to be mindful you know to just do something for your mind right so that's one second now to your question in terms of symptoms and you know the signs that we can look out for i would say the foremost first three things that we're looking at is that sometimes sadness it can be um, you know confused for depression but depression or you know when you literally feel that okay something is literally going wrong is when that sadness prolongs for a very long time and when i say very long time maybe that sadness is prolonging for more than a month or more than two months so that is like your first sign and see the other thing is that uh, i would say the unfortunate part about a bad mental health is that it a lot of times or most of the times it starts to manifest in the form of physical symptoms so constant body aches fatigues where you're feeling that you know what my energy levels are not as high as they used to be um, i'm constantly maybe getting frustrated i'm trembling maybe i you know get i get hyperventilated very often and a lot of times you know you just know from within that there is something or the else like a thought or some situation which has been bugging you for very long and now it has started to manifest let's say in the form of arm aches neck aches or even you know your whole body paining and things like that so i would say the first of few manifestations of symptoms is in the form of bodily aspects and that's why we say that always every day take out time to scan your body you know like from your toe till your head scan every part like try to realize that or try to feel that where is stress sitting where is that tension sitting is it sitting in the neck is it sitting in the chest is it sitting in your legs and so forth and so on so prolonged sadness you are not feeling the same levels of energy you are not behaving the same way as you do with your near and dear ones uh, you are not getting the feeling to do anything like you know you are not feeling motivated you are not looking forward to things and last of all bodily manifestations i think these are a couple of things which tell you that hey my mental health now needs to be taken care of i need to pay attention to thanks kanika uh given your experience you know you work with a lot of organizations including gm financial i want to understand how open are companies today to have a dialogue around these conversations and how do you think on a serious note can we walk the talk you know we truly believe that initiatives like talking about mental health or well-being overall cannot be a one day affair it has to be more sustained you know it cannot be Absolutely. just a campaign yeah so how are you seeing a shift are you seeing the needle moving in that direction and how do you think in organizations promote a culture of well being yeah. whether it is physical mental you know i'd like to know your thoughts on that yeah i mean see it's such a it's such an expansive topic that i can go on and on 
uh, but I would just say three things, right? The first thing, let me talk from a JM financial perspective and not because, you know, I'm on this live with you guys, but I still remember that when we started with you all, um, your, uh, the, the entire human resource leadership team, all of them, I was so shocked that when we launched it for you guys, the next, I would say 30 to 40 days, it were the leaders who were saying that, you know, first we want to get onto this. Only then we can sort of trickle it down and, you know, set an example for our team members. So there was a, there was a great thing that I saw over there and I, uh, and I remember that, so Madhu from your team, she always says that, you know what, it's not about creating psychological safety. She uses the term psychological comfort. And I love that, you know, she says that it's just not about safety. It's about someone feeling mentally and emotionally safe at where they are. Right. So I think the foremost thing which you guys did and which is a learning that like I also shared the HubSpot example is that it cannot be that you take the services or you take these external, you know, you tell people that, hey, counseling is available. Hey, all these tools are available. You have, it's the leaders actually who have to walk the door. It's the leaders who have to first get vulnerable and then they have to uh, sort of create an example, set an example so that the, the other team members can feel comfortable to be themselves, right? So that's the first thing. Second thing, like you said, it's not an overnight journey. It's a gradual process. You can't say that, you know, that, hey, uh, we have now introduced it. Everything will get fine. All the culture will be uh, absolutely okay. And, you know, all of these things will happen. So it's not an overnight thing. It's a gradual process that you have to take in. I just want to, I don't know how many people who've joined us here are from, you know, different organizations. But I just want to give you an example that uh, doing things related to your mental well-being don't always have to be around therapy or there is no, you know, uh, one stop way to do this. Okay. Um, we just very recently did a very, uh, like it, it was a very fun thing that we did. We did something called emotion stations. So this was a client in Bangalore where for three days we set up these beautiful emotion stations. So there was one station, which was of joy. There was another station of anger. Then there was another station of calm. Then, you know, so forth and so on. So there were like six to seven emotions that we had put there. And what the employees were supposed to do is that whichever emotion they are most relating to, they can go onto that, uh, you know, onto that stall, onto that station. And they learned healthy ways of regulating that emotion. So if it is anger, then they learned on that station that, how do you feel anger? Uh, anger is always a secondary emotion. It's not a primary emotion. Anger is always caused because of other emotions. So the idea here is that don't see mental well-being as like a checkbox. You know, mental well-being is also about empowering your teams and your organization with emotional stability, with helping them to regulate their emotions, with helping them to understand that what each emotion, what each feeling means, right? Uh, and yeah, and to your last part, we have definitely seen a huge uptake in all these things. Like I said in the beginning that it is now becoming a huge demand. And if uh, employers really want to uh, you know attract the best talent if they want to have great culture this is something that i don't think we can do without anymore uh, sure on that note i think i'd like to just very quickly touch upon you know one of these small but important initiatives again i'm coming back to the active listening bit that we touched upon uh, we for GM Financial launched a campaign which is called Here For You, which emphasizes the need for listening. You know, I think uh, given the fact that we spend closer to nine, ten hours or upwards of that, you know, I think it's very, very important to build friends or at least have that kind of a support system that to, I mean, if, if at all, there is a need to vent out emotions, I think we have to um like you said uh, uh, create maybe a stable a comforting environment where people feel comfortable they don't carry that baggage back home you know so yeah. i think on that note uh, you know uh, we will kind of take those conversations ahead in the consecutive months in the coming up months and we'll also see how we can probably build on to that you know 
uh, these kind of conversations the more we talk like you said it's a journey and it's an ongoing process but if we start and if there is a top down commitment i think sooner or later it becomes a movement it becomes a integration part of the culture mm-hmm. so very happy that we made some efforts uh, on that note and i'm sure uh, youngsters today are very very open to these kind of dialogues conversations so we are very hopeful that you know we get an audience uh, who is uh, very encouraging for such initiatives um without wasting more time i'll just like to sort of wrap up and you know take a moment to reflect on what you touched upon i think it's very difficult to summarize into key bullets because as you said it's very expansive as a topic but uh, i'm glad we touched upon uh, active listening we touched upon wellness and the need for prioritizing mental health okay um, just like we probably would go to a doctor similarly prioritizing mental well being is an ongoing effort and we should sort of take our time to see because everybody's journey is so different i think it's very important that we for ourselves know what are those signs keep uh, maybe look at uh, journaling as a technique or whatever be the methods that suit each one of us sometimes uh, you know just talking it out with probably friends families we we could look at those aspects and see what works best uh, and also probably integrating the physical aspects because it's also interconnected so the physical affects the mental vice versa so i think again in totality when we look at it as a package it all comes down beautifully well uh, i'll just uh, you know use this time to see if we have some uh, audience questions kanika sure Uh, yes um, the first one kanika is can taking regular breaks really improve mental health and productivity absolutely right like <laughs> this is a, a given you know but um, but you know there are techniques like we and i feel that again because uh, in our culture working end to end long hours is something is considered to be a very uh, thing of proud which we need to i think get away from right like being busy uh, be working late is people take pride in that and i think that's something that we need to stop uh, i would say encouraging number one but number two when it comes to breaks there are also ways in which you can make your breaks more effective like just to very quickly say that there is something called a pomodoro technique now in your pomodoro pomodoro technique happens because it clinically helps you to become more productive so what does a pomodoro technique say a pomodoro technique says that you work for let's say 60 minutes then you take let's say a 15 minute break then you work again and then you take a break so there's a pattern that is followed for for a pomodoro technique otherwise when you're taking breaks try to move your body do something mindful um do something uh, a lot of people nowadays like to listen to nature sounds so when you're taking breaks you can try to make them more effective as well uh, especially when you're taking it uh, during your work but please do not underestimate the importance of breaks we always take break like you know we keep our leaves collected and then we're like okay ab year end pe breaks lenge but the whole year you realize that you've been burnt out so much you've not been productive you you know you're not in your best energies etc uh, so break needs to be taken consistently i think there are a few interesting questions kanika uh, i think one we have one more which is how do i talk to my boss about mental health without uh fearing judgment i think that's something all of us will be really willing to listen because uh, whether it's the immediate boss or i think people do have a problem in general opening up when it becomes a workplace thing so how do you think is there a way to kind of normalize these conversations uh, say this in a lighter way so that it's taken seriously yet not looked down upon yeah, yeah. so a uh, very tricky one always but i i can only speak from my experience that genuine and uh, if you're open about it uh, 
I think it will work out. Like in like just giving an example that I as a leader of course have to create that safe space, vulnerable space for my team members. And then if I am doing that, it just helps my team members to do that as well. But a lot of times, can you still hear me? I think someone said. Yeah, we can. We can now. We can hear you. I okay. think momentarily there was a bit of an interruption, but it's all good okay. now. Great. So I was saying that um, that basically keep it keep it a very genuine conversation because that builds trust and uh, keep it a very genuine conversation. It builds trust and go exactly with how you are feeling, how uh, you know your emotions are. But all I'll say is that never go with a feeling of overwhelm. Always think. Let your let your sensory and let your nerves calm down. right and then go and have such conversations but start to be open about it i think i also want uh, i also want to say this i should have said it earlier it is not just the responsibility of organizations to make this happen it's also the responsibility of employees to make that space you know uh, because we see that a lot of employees shy away they fear but the movement can only happen if employees also participate in it open heartedly and you know with all the trust so yeah yeah of course i think it's uh, each one of us who has a role to play so it's obviously very important that uh, we prioritize ourselves and make a start on that note our next question is how can i support a coworker who is struggling with their mental health great one so i think the very first thing we uh, talked about listen listen to them a lot of uh, companies have uh, this thing where you know and and i know the jmf has also done this where we have this thing called um, becoming empathy peer support uh, groups right so now what happens there is that firstly if you're going through something or if you know that your colleague is going through something listen to them create a safe space for them right and always think that if you were in their shoe what would you want um on that note i i want to tell you guys it's, it's a very cool thing um i don't know if you know simon sinek I, I, i don't know how many of you know him just google simon sinek 8 minutes just put that on google there's going to be a video that will come up and he gives a beautiful uh, just a 2 minute thing where he talks about uh, how a friend of his needed help and uh, simon said that hey you never told me that you needed help and she said that no i actually did because i used to message you that hey how are you what are you doing are you free today and you always used to um, you know either not reply or if if you used to reply you used to be late about it and then that's when simon said that the way for people near you everyone's way of reaching out for help can be different and that's when they created a when he he created a code of 8 minutes so as soon, he said as soon as my friend will say to me or my coworker will say that hey do you have 8 minutes i will understand that they need help from you right so create these safe spaces uh when someone is when you're asking someone how are you and they say i'm good don't stop at that right ask them to extrapolate that are you really good or not like what is happening inside tell me what is up uh, all of these things go a very long way in helping your coworkers sure i think we have time for just one last question um kanika how can you create uh, how can you create healthy boundaries between your career and personal life great a uh, very good question i think the concept of boundaries is very underestimated in our culture again and see boundaries is a very customizing concept to everyone right for example um uh, if when i'm back from office and it's 7 o'clock and if i'm saying that look now all my time after 7 pm is going to be for me right then you have to create a boundary to say that look i'm not going to take any office calls i'm not going to check my email i'm not going to do any work related thing making boundaries setting boundaries is a very individualistic thing 
right and when you do that you have to communicate them well as well a lot of us create boundaries but we are not able to follow them right so it's like like i can just talk about myself like from a personal example that uh, for me i mean as a founder there is a very thin line you know it's it's always like all over the place but then for example weekends or let's say after 9 o'clock at night whatever can happen whatever can happen i know that i will not touch work let's say um, or weekends i know that you know let's say saturdays or sundays are for my own reading it's for me to spend time with my pet or whatever i am not going to you know uh, talk or do work or any of those things and you know there is boundary settings in relationships also a lot of times in our personal setting we end up discussing work a lot like i have a boundary with my partner that we do not talk about work on certain days with each other so like i could be feeling whatever but we have this thing that i'm not going to discuss my work with you at all if it's a sunday so i think it all depends on how do you want your boundaries to be and then you make sure you execute it and you follow it thanks kali Like I think these personal anecdotes that you're sharing really that make a difference because coming from you as a founder, probably I today I think one of the key takeaways for me is how closely is communications linked to this whole thing that we are talking. Whether it's about expressing oneself or it's about listening, I think um, me looking at that as a function and then it all kind of linking together, um, it's kind of uh, very very interesting. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Kanika, for the time today that you spent on us. We are going to try and collaborate with you a lot more. Thank you for the wonderful audience who joined us and took some time off. And I hope this was useful for each one of us. I'd just like to conclude by saying, let's continue to do our bit to prioritize mental health, well-being. Together, uh, we are all uh, together in this journey, and I hope we can sort of rise and thrive. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.